Hello, everybody. Uh, great pleasure and honor to be here. I think, yeah, by the way, you're not the only, only person struggling with my sure name. In fact, I have, uh, yeah, Talk to some people, they say that it's, it's the most scary moment is introducing me because of my sure name. So, um, as you may can guess by my accent, I'm, uh, I'm German, but I do not work for a German car manufacturer, so I'm not afraid of uh, being crushed by, by uh, Tesla. Anyway, um, I'm the global CTO of the OLX group. Um, so, may, can you show me who has ever heard of uh, OLX? Uh, a few. Who has heard of uh, Nespers? Even less. Anyway, uh, some people refer to us as the biggest internet company you have never heard of. Um, <laughs> so to get started, uh, let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, so as mentioned, the OLX group is part of Nespers. Uh, Nespers is a South African-based internet and entertainment group with a market cap than more than 100 billion. It was founded in 1915. So more than 100 years old, they started with uh, basically newspaper business. Um, then later they moved into, into uh, pay TV, satellite uh, TV broadcasting, uh, primarily in Africa, and uh, then they started investing. Um, I think they're known for one of the, let's say, most successful uh, investments in technology or in the internet uh, history. So basically they, they bought a share of 33% of uh, Tencent, which is now one of the largest uh, companies in, on, on Earth. Um, and in addition, right, they started investing more and more into other companies like uh, Brainly, the OLX Group. Uh, now we are quite bullish about uh, food delivery, so we also own now a large share of Delivery Hero and uh, many other industry. So in fact, uh, Nespers heavily in invests into things like uh, FinTech, video entertainment, e-commerce, education, health, uh, food delivery, and classifieds. And uh, this is what we do. So the OLX group is Nespers classified segment. Uh, in simple words, uh, we enable our users to pretty much buy and sell everything within their local communities. Um, very similar to Gumtree or Spock uh, here in the UK. Uh, we do facilitate more transactions than any other classifieds player on earth. And our mission is uh, to make trading of used goods as simple, as convenient, as safe, and as much fun as possible, driven by smart technology solutions. Um, our portfolio is quite large, so we run a portfolio of different uh, platforms and products. So our main brand uh, is uh, OLX and emerging markets. Then let go uh, in the US and Turkey, Avito, one of the largest internet companies in Russia. And then we're also active in quite a bunch of, let's say, uh, uh, verticals, uh, primarily focusing on real estate and cars. By the way, uh, the auto trader here is auto trader South Africa, not uh, auto trader UK. There was kind of, uh, yeah, I think they, they, they forked the code some time ago, became successful also in South Africa, and then they got acquired by us, but not, uh, not the UK auto trader. And uh, yeah, and we're also looking at uh, new models in uh, services, heavy machinery, fashion. Um, so let's look at a few numbers. Um, as you can see, we are not that small. So currently we operate uh, in around 43 markets um, where, do, where we serve around 350 million unique uh, customers every month. Uh, we do have 35 offices and employ more than 5,000 people. Out of those, uh, the, that, uh, 1,000 work on product development and engineering. We run a couple of development hubs around the globe, including cities like Moscow, Barcelona, Lisbon, Poznan, Buenos Aires, Dubai, Delhi, Rio, and Berlin. So, uh, yeah, as, as you may can guess, I spent uh, way too much of my life in planes, but uh, that, that's another story. Um, so the thing I want to talk to you today about and the story I want to share uh, uh, with you today is about our technology transformation. So uh, we heard the word uh, transformation quite a few times today already. And yeah, like other companies, right, we are pivoting from a more, let's say, marketing-led company towards a more customer-centric and product and technology-driven company. Um, so for that, I want to look at a couple of industry trends and explain what they mean for us and our transformation. Um, so currently, I would say I see us somewhere between two waves, right? The last wave was about uh, trends and topics like big data, social, mobile, and cloud. I think they, these continue evolving, whereas the current wave is about topics like AI, blockchain, or IoT. Um, um, so let's take a brief look at a couple of those trends, uh, both from the last and the current wave. 
to get started, I have to talk about mobile. Oh, mobile. Anyway, uh, nothing new at all, but still relevant, right? Um, mobile was probably one of the biggest, uh, biggest game changer ever happened to our industry. It clearly changed the world, and I think the, the, the phrase mobile is eating the world is somewhat true, right? Uh, smartphones enabled us to all walk around with a supercomputer in our pocket, right? And still every month, millions and millions of people are onboarded to the internet that has never had a computer before. Um, this trend continues, especially in the developing countries, right? And therefore, it matters a lot for us uh, due to our strong focus on emerging markets. Um, and some of our key markets like uh, India, right? Uh, more than 90% of the whole of our traffic is coming from mobile. Um, this uh, somewhat means we have no other choice but to be mobile first. Um, yeah, but uh, does mobile first uh, automatically means up first, right? I think while apps are great, they also made the world somewhat uh, complicated, right? And I think, yeah, we, we, we lost a lot of the beauty and the simplicity of the web. So, right, suddenly we had to think about things like um, operating systems and uh, different programming platforms such as Android or iOS. Some are even dead by now. Um, others, Nokia, Blackberry, I don't know, are even more dead. Um, then, uh, yeah, we need to think about different device capabilities, low-end phones, uh, right, high-end phones. Then uh, we went back to client-side installation, which feels a little bit like going back to the 90s. Um, the only thing is, yeah, that apps get shipped uh, through the air and not via, via CD-ROM, but still it's client-based uh, installations, which then forced us to think about, yeah, backward compatibility, API versioning, all that thing, right? Um, in addition also, I think, yeah, apps, uh, apps cannot be easily linked, right? So the whole idea of, uh, yeah, resource, linking between resources of the web uh, got lost. Um, yeah, and then there's the problem uh, with the discovery in the App Store, right? A lot of, uh, most of the attention just goes through a handful of apps. So overall, right, in, 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 in general, I think that makes app development uh, quite, quite expensive and also very expensive to market. So I think, right, if you may think of your own product, um, yeah, typically, what, what is the main thing you buy for all the marketing money spent uh, in, into an app? Any idea? It's uh, uninstalls. So basically, you spend a lot of marketing money to buy uninstalls. Um, but don't get me wrong, right? Uh, apps are great, and they offer great UX, and uh, yeah, they allow us to leverage the full capabilities uh, of, of, of the devices. Um, Quick look at the traffic comparison between uh, web and apps. I think this is uh, on, on mobile. I think this is a, it's a little older already, but uh, yeah, I think you, you get the idea, right? The, the app model had been tremendously successful primarily in Western world markets, but it was less so in the emerging markets. And even if you think of the US, right, where 80% of the traffic um, on, on mobile comes from apps, out of that 80%, 80% come just from a handful of apps, right? Uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, and the like, which basically means that uh, all other apps are somewhat uh, dead content in the App Store, right? Uh, main known by your families and grandmas, but uh, that's, uh, that's uh, pretty much it. So what does that mean, right? Uh, what should we optimize for? Uh, what alternatives do exist? Um, so I think an interesting alternative today is PWA. Right, uh, PWA uses modern uh, browser technologies to build app-like experience. Um, in general, P PWA is not more than basically right, uh, describing a set of technologies, design concepts, and web APIs. But it supports features like push notifications, offline support. Right? It can run in an app shell without the browser around, and you can even install it uh, on your home screen, on, on your phone, like, like, uh, basically like an app via an app manifest. And PWA by now is widely supported by modern browsers. Um, and the trick, and that's why it's called uh, progressive uh, web apps, right? Uh, PWA makes progressive use of the browser capabilities uh, guaranteeing compatibility. Um, the thing I personally like a lot about PWA is the offline support, right? Um, Today we live in a kind of a battery, battery powered, uh, disconnected world, uh, but many of the web technologies we use today are still, let's say, leftovers from the always connected days. I do believe PWA is uh, changing that. So eventually, right, uh, PWA can combine the simplicity of the web uh, with the power of the apps. Um, 
So what does that mean for us, right? I think, um, what will be the winning model, uh, you, you may ask. Um, I think at this moment, this is entirely unclear. Um, last year, I was in uh, Mountain View visiting Google. I think they merged the Android teams and the Chrome teams, and they also have no clue where, where the future is heading. So I think there's no other chance uh, than, than in continue investing in both. So for us, it means we, we continue investing in apps, while on the other side, right, we really want to accelerate our transition to PWA, where we launched a couple of markets already. And uh, yeah, I'm quite uh, bullish about PWA in terms of yeah, being able to um, unlock additional growth potential for some of our, our markets. Um, by the way, things also get very blurry uh, if you think about right, uh, browsers like Chrome, right, they becoming operating system and app stores, whereas Android suddenly starts streaming apps. So it's, it's a little bit uh, all over the place, but super, super interesting. Uh, times, so I, I would encourage everybody to take a look at uh, PWA. The next uh, big thing of the last technology wave, uh, yeah, is cloud. Uh, a lot had been said here already. I think uh, we 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 all agree the, these days are over, and it's uh, simply not the business uh, we are in. Right? I think uh, there's a zero competitive advantage uh, you can have these days by running your own data centers. And yeah, today every kid can probably some, uh, build something that scales globally. So it's uh, much smarter to invest all your sweat, tears, time, and money into yeah, creating customer value instead of putting machines into racks or manage low-level technologies. Um, yeah, and over the last, uh, last years, right, cloud became the new norm. I think we, we all know that. The beginning had been early adopters, had been startups and internet companies, but today, yeah, even even let's say more traditional industry, large enterprises moved into cloud. Uh, I think, yeah, in almost every any any every successful internet company um, that had been founded in the last day was born in the cloud. Uh, in the last years, was born in the cloud. Um, I also believe, right there, there will soon be a new generation of engineers that uh, yeah, almost have uh, seen nothing but the cloud. Um, so for me, the biggest achievement of the cloud was actually to democratize kind of compute power and equalize the game. Um, I think the main reason for the success is flexibility, or um, uh, better called uh, business agility, right? Cloud allows us to adapt and react much faster. Um, Often the future in terms of business, customer needs, competition, traffic is unpredictable. So to survive, right, you need an environment that allows you to react quickly and allows you to focus on customer value because that's at the end the only thing your customer cares about. Um, in the past, for example, right, ordering a strong machine to do, I don't know, machine learning or whatsoever, right, could take months. Uh, today, there are whole companies born uh, in the same time. Um, um, but in order to gain full benefit of the cloud, right, it's also not just about compute anymore. I think it's really about yeah, uh, embracing cloud native, which means right, yeah, you have to understand and use the cloud um, right, and all of their managed services as a development platform. Quick recap, I think we saw a similar picture from uh, Jim earlier today. Um, Right, over the past, we moved from, let's say, traditional data centers over virtualization into a cloud. Again, more than just compute. It's basically a whole development platform offering all kinds of managed services and keeps evolving. Then, uh, yeah, containers came up, which I think is, is great. They, they allowed us to abstract from the operating system, spawn up in seconds rather than minutes, and now the latest trend is uh, serverless, uh, which is pretty cool, right? It basically allows you to run a piece of software without the notion of servers, so you basically give something for execution and pay as you go for, for execution time. Um, yeah, what does that mean for us, right? A few years back, um, we, we as OLX for the whole group decided to go all in and move all our applications into the cloud. Um, that, that was quite a huge uh, migration and transformation. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to say that we are, that we are finishing our AWS migration or we finished our AWS migration this summer and we've yeah, finally shutting down uh, our last data center. Um, but we also did a lift, lot of lift and shift as part of that uh, journey, right? And now it's really about becoming more cloud native and re-architect our applications to, to, to gain the full benefits of being in the cloud. Um, let's look at some, some trend from the current wave, right? Uh, so let's talk about AI. By the way, I very much uh, like the, the thing that uh, the lady 
said, uh, uh, applied uh, intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. Uh, the, the lady that didn't like the walk-in music. <laughs> I think it's one of the biggest buzzwords, obviously, these days. And yeah, many companies, even Google, they talk about becoming AI first or AI everywhere. Yeah, but I think, yeah, the, the question is, is that really a revolution, right? Um, I think many things like deep learning, neural networks, all the hyped stuff, right, is around actually for some time. And in fact, I think yeah, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science was uh, going through waves of success and silence before. Still, right, this time people say, mm, it's somewhat different and the impact is huge and maybe even as huge as the Industrial Revolution. And yeah, it's somewhat obvious that AI is changing our society and has have start having impact on our everyday life and yeah, also changes the way we program computers. So uh, why is that happening all now and uh, what is different this time? Um, I primarily see three reasons, right? The, the first one is data availability. So over the last years, right, uh, storage technologies uh, got better, so we managed to store a lot of data. On the other side, often it stopped there, like, hey, I'm doing big data, what do you do? Yeah, I store a lot. Yeah, great, uh, but now finally we can start making use of that data. Um, then I think there's access, uh, easy access and cheaper compute power. And last but not least, it's about uh, frameworks and technologies, right? Frameworks like um, yeah, MXNet or TensorFlow are really becoming commodity, which means that uh, speed of innovation is accelerating. Um, so how we deal with that? As mentioned, right, the race of AI is a lot of, uh, driven by the availability of data. So to get started, right, it's, first you need to solve your data problem. Um, and if we, if we talk about data, I think you can break down the problem into four main areas. Right? The first one is, let's say, data collection and um, um, storing of data. Um, uh, right? as, a, as a central data lake, we use S3, so that's kind of our foundation. And then we, we've developed all kinds of tools to collect data, which allow us to replicate data from all our transactional databases, um, but also track our user behavior. So currently, we capture around 4 billion events per day, and I think in S3 we, we're storing around 400 terabyte uh, of co compressed data. Then the second uh, part is uh, data democratization. That's, I think, by far the most uh, crucial and most important part, uh, right? You want to make sure that, that you are able to give each and everyone in the company easy and self-service access to exactly the data that he or she needs. Um, this is not easy, right? It has, again, has to be done in a self-service uh, way, but also in a secure and compliant manner, which is a bit uh, tricky these days if you, if you think of uh, GDPR. Um, but then once the data is available, right, it's, it's about making use of your data. So it's a traditional BI and reporting on top, not talking much about that. But then only once you have solved those kind of underlying problems, right, then you can go into product innovation, data products and, and uh, things like AI and ML. Um, what do we do here, right? So, uh, we believe that um, yeah, AI, ML can be of help for many steps in our user journey. So therefore, we're investing quite a bit in, in both tooling and people, right? I think it's, it's not a secret that uh, talent is quite scarce in that uh, field, so it's also about, yeah, let's say, enabling existing engineers, right, to easily experiment uh, with those technologies, um, right, and to, to have training programs, but we also started working on uh, offering a default kind of pipeline uh, based on AWS SageMaker, allowing us to do model training, feature engineering, and serving of models uh, at scale. Um, we already use it quite a bit, um, so for, let's say, fraud prevention, content moderation, recommender system, search ranking, um, image classification and uh, categorization. Um, for the ones uh, from the US that know LetGo, I think LetGo also has now a pretty cool feature, which basically, right, you, you take the smartphone, point the camera on, I don't know, random stuff in, in, in your household, and it basically immediately on, on the screen shows you, I don't know, what, is, what could be the title of the item, what is the average time to sell it, what can you ask for in terms of price, which category it belongs in, and then you click a button and the, the item gets posted. Pretty cool, so I think uh, moving forward, we try to accelerate uh, our investments in that field. And then uh, last, I want to talk about something I have actually no clue whether this is a real trend or which wave it belongs in, um, but it's something I hear people discussing more and more, also, also here, 
right? It's what, uh, what I call, or some people call, platform thinking. Um, so what is this, um, right? Uh, what we can observe, um, uh, what we can observe is that most successful internet companies, like yeah, we talked about it, Netflix, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba, the, the big guys, right? They they can scale globally and they can move with um, extreme speed. Um, typically, they can also quickly expand into new territories by either international expansion or by launching new products. Right. In addition, those companies are much more technology and product driven and customer centric than previous companies. So the question is, right, what do they make different? Um, yeah, and, and, and there I think right, most of them think of platforms as business cap capabilities that can be easily reused and rewired. Um, this allows them to adapt and uh, yeah, change quickly. Um, basically, platforms are essentially libraries of services and business capabilities. Uh, exposed to each other as APIs. I think um, that started some, some, sometime in 2002 when uh, Bezos wrote this uh, famous email to his employees. Yeah, 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 you either build everything as a service and uh, make it available via an API or, or you get fired. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, the yeah, success of Amazon uh, somewhat proved him right. Um, and then right, the, the result is that these companies model their organization as a kind of a set of autonomous kind of um, 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 services and autonomous software-defined capabilities that then kind of unlocks uh, organizational complexity, right, and allows them to kill, kill, uh, yeah, uh, kill the things that otherwise right, impact speed, innovation, and customer centricity. Um, why does that matter for us? Um, yeah, as, 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 as you have seen at the beginning, right, uh, we do have a lot of platforms driven by our M&A activities. Um, but also we have a high appetite to go into new territories, uh, try out new business models, right, and experiment. Uh, at the same time, we do believe that classifieds is kind of a universal problem, right? The, the need of trading used goods is, uh, so to say, a global human need. Um, but currently, we do have a lot of duplication uh, based uh, right, uh, from our monolithic application, uh, applications, and it makes it somewhat difficult to kind of uh, reuse, share, and uh, adapt quickly. Um, so therefore, we are currently yeah, more and more decomposing our products into finer grained uh, business capabilities that can be used across products. Um, doing so right, uh, will allow us to better leverage our global workforce, remove duplication, um, but also kind of uh, allow us to focus on innovation where it really matters. Um, this is a very simple kind of uh, generic blueprint, right, of our architecture idea. So if you think of capabilities, right, at the bat bottom you basically have foundational technology capabilities. A lot of them, right, is uh, actually handled by the cloud, but then it's also around tooling that allows you to yeah, self-service um, your infrastructure, right? It's about monitoring, um, all, all, all those kind of tools. Um, then at the bottom is also our big data infrastructure that we talked about, and we're currently working heavily on uh, building out our experimentation infrastructure. Right, there are a few kind of commercial tools, but we had not been really happy with most of them, and especially if you move more and more to microservices and distributed kind of systems, right, you want to have something that, yeah, that you can easily plug in and also kind of right, run experiments spanning across multiple services, uh, which, is, uh, which is not uh, an easy thing to do. Um, then on top of those foundational capabilities, right, uh, sits what, what we call business capabilities. Um, in our case, they typically come in two flavors. Uh, one is what we call shared services. So these are things that we use across uh, uh, multiple products. Things like image serving, authentication, location handling, recommender system, um, and others. And then there are product specific services, which are yeah, specific to one product. Often these are things we carve out of the monolithic application. If proven, we often also then downstream them later to the ar array of shared services. Um, on top of that, right, there's simply um, some API management in the form of an API gateway. The reason for that is right, we don't want to expose all our internal services to the public and want to have kind of a single entry point for our end user application. And then finally, the, the top layer is our end user applications, web, mobile, etc., uh, for all our various products. Um, so let me end with, let's say, right, uh, this transformation we're undertaking is not an easy one, right? And um, so, yeah, let, let me end with, let's say, talking about two things that, that help us to manage our transformation. 
right? One, one struggle we had was kind of yeah, keeping our technology under control. Um, right? so we have a lot of development hubs. You want to empower teams. You want to grant a lot of freedom. On the other side, yeah, every, any technology you use needs to be actively managed. Um, so we wanted to put some con control into that while still allowing a lot of yeah, choice and flexibility and freedom. So therefore, we introduced something that we call the tech radar. Uh, not, not an idea from us, right? Originally, the idea comes from ThoughtWorks. Um, it's also embraced by companies like uh, Salando. And uh, basically, to get started, what we have done is we, we looked at all the main technologies we are using and, and did a first ring assessment. So we clustered them into four rings, right? Uh, one ring is kind of hold, which means by these are technologies we don't want to invest further. It doesn't mean we immediately uh, phase them out, but we just do not going to invest any further, and we're not going to build new things with those technology. Assess basically is uh, yeah, technologies we want to take a look at, trialists, things we, things we believe, they can be great technologies moving forward, so we want to try them out on our, on our serious production um, circumstances and then adapt as things that, that we want our teams to adapt. Typically, right, we ask now teams whenever they take the technology decision to take a look, look at the radar and use that as one of their input sources. Um, moving forward, there will be a team of senior engineers right, that gets together once per quarter, discuss new technologies, latest developments, and then updates the radar for us on, on, a, on a quarterly basis. And then that's the, that's the last thing. Um, as you can imagine, right, um, yeah, moving to with all those services, all those applications, all the distributed development uh, yeah, uh, across multiple locations, that requires rock solid monitoring and insights. Uh, for most of that, uh, no surprise, uh, we use New Relic. Um, so we are very happy with uh, New Relic, and that had been really of great help for us. Um, we more or less used the full suite, including APM, mobile insights, uh, synthetics. And the thing that my teams uh, love the most recently is uh, distributed tracing, of course. Um, yeah, and we also use it for something that we introduced that, that we call uh, the OBIC5. So um, this is basically a set of operational metrics we look at for each of our main products and services, right? The first thing we look at is availability, which we simply measure with New Relic. Then uh, for performance, uh, we look at something that is called Updex. It's an open standard. Uh, it's an application performance index. Um, again, uh, that open standard is also um, supported by New Relic, um, uh, so we measure it also with New Relic. Then for operations, we just look at MTTR, mean time to recover. Then obviously we look at costs, which is uh, in relation to our monthly active users. And last but not least, we, we have a security grade, with, uh, which is a mix of yeah, internal audit, compliance need, uh, automated penetration testing, and uh, manual security testing. So in this kind of yeah, scorecard we use to, to measure the health of uh, any of our products and services. This is uh, what I wanted to share with you today. So thanks a lot, and uh, thanks to the guys from New Relic for, for having me. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.